<laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. Well, I know this is supposed to stand up a little better than that, but I can see it fine. Last, last night, um, <clears throat> if you were here, uh, you know I preached on, on forgiveness. And if you weren't here, I still preached on forgiveness last night, so <laughs> either way. Uh, the preacher's Sunday sermon was on forgive your enemies. And toward the end of the service, he asked his congregation, how many of you have forgiven their enemies? About half of them held up their hands. He then repeated his question as it was past lunchtime. This time about 80% held up their hands. He then repeated his question again. All responded except one elderly lady. Mrs. Jones inquired the preacher, Are you not willing to forgive your enemies? I don't have any, she replied smiling sweetly. Mrs. Jones, that's very unusual. How old are you? Ninety-three, she replied. Oh, Miss Jones, what a blessing and a lesson to all of us who are here. Would you please come down in front of the congregation and tell us how a person can live 93 years and not have an enemy in the world? The little sweetheart of a lady tottered down the aisle, faced the congregation and said, I outlive the old hags. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> more, one, more than one way to get it done, isn't there? Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to serve the Lord? Yes. We, have the best, we have the best thing going. There isn't anything in life better than what we have. And, and, uh, it, and, it, and it carries on into eternity. So that we not only live uh, in the joy of the Lord now. You know, I, I, I know I'm headed to heaven. I try not to think of it too much because I don't want to get homesick for heaven. I got too much to do down here. But I know heaven's going to be wonderful. But uh, if there was no heaven, I'd still want to serve God. Because there's nothing like knowing him and serving him. It's the greatest life that there is. And uh, just that privilege of being a child of God is, is, is great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I keep talking about this, and I, I'm actually trying my best to work on it, but uh, I, I have not wanted to write a book. Uh, you know, you, you get busy, you write a book, you spend all that time, and then you've got to try to spend the rest of the time finding somebody that will buy it. We, we had, I, I think I might have been in Pekin, I'm not sure, but we had uh, an evangelist that uh, he said that he, he had written the book and, and it was on, on, on sale. And he encouraged us to buy a book. He said, I am really attached to this book. Matter of fact, he said, I'm attached to about 350 of them. Please buy one. <laughs> so, uh, I, but I, I really feel that the Lord has moved on my heart to, uh, to write a book. Um, and and I, I, so I'm, I'm getting started on it and hopefully uh, hopefully uh, Jesus willing uh, in the next 20 years we'll get it out <laughs> hopefully sooner much sooner than that but um, <clears throat> I I know that there's a lot of times that we pray and we pray and we pray and then we don't get what we prayed for and um, that can be extremely discouraging. Someone said if you make a mistake and learn from it, you made a mistake. But if you make a mistake and don't learn from it, you make two mistakes. And so uh, if, we're, if we prayed for something and didn't get the breakthrough that we want, the most important thing for us is not to throw faith away or to, or to change our doctrine. The most important thing is to dig into the Word of God and find out what more we need to understand, what more we need to do in order to come uh, through to that victory. I have about uh, 12 chapters, uh, 10 to 12 chapters that uh, I'll be writing about uh, the, a checklist in essence. I haven't figured out the title yet, but um, the, a, a checklist on uh, what you need to do and how you need to do it. Because a lot of times we, uh, we just don't get the job done and we try to figure out, well, I, I know I walk by faith. I, I know I did what I'm supposed to do. And uh, why didn't I get what I was praying for, what I was believing God for? And uh, I, I just think that uh, what God has given me to write will help people to be able to sit down and read through the book and say, I missed it here. 
I've missed it there because because there is a way to walk by faith and it's important that we learn uh, how how to walk and to live by faith the first thing that you have to do the, the, I mean you have to settle this before anything else the problem is never with God what the Word of God says is absolute what the Word of God says is true it doesn't matter what we manifest or don't manifest it doesn't change the word so um, uh, it, it, it's never a problem with God and so what is it where does it come it comes back on us and and God tells us in his word my people are destroyed and I wish you wouldn't have said that but it's fact people of God are often destroyed in one way or another finances health uh, uh, family marriage whatever and he said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and and uh, uh, I like it translated more like this my people are destroyed for what they don't understand um, so it, it's important for us that we just reestablish ourselves in faith and and press in to understand deeper and stronger and I'm not preaching one of the chapters I don't think I am uh, I'm not preaching one of the chapters tonight in this message but I am going to talk about faith and how faith works and uh, that we just stir ourselves up in our walk in our life of faith um, Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 35 let's start by going there uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35 Some of you I've known for uh, how many years? I didn't even stop to figure it out before I said it. 40? 42? Two years? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, 40, 40 some years. Uh, I, guess that's, I guess that's accurate. I, I didn't figure it up quick, but it, I'm sure it is. And um, so you, you've known me. I, I think about what, what the Apostle Paul said when in the book of Acts he's writing uh, to our, he's talking to the elders from the Ephesus he's on his way uh, to Jerusalem and uh, he stops off and he calls them in and as he's talking to them he said I was with you in all seasons and I think that's a significant statement that's a significant thing in other words Paul said you've watched me walk this you've watched me live this myself through all seasons uh, they saw him when he was beaten. They saw him uh, when they tried to shut him up. They saw him when he went through battles. Uh, there are times that uh, he talks in the word about, about being in a weakened condition. And some people say, well, you see, he got sick. He Listen, folks, if you, if you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, what he went through, what does it say? Four times he was beaten with rods. Three times he was beaten, 39 stripes, save one. That's seven beatings that in many cases would kill a natural man. And he went through all of those things in his walk with God. And he said, uh, I was with you in all seasons. So he's saying in essence, uh, you've seen me when I've fought the battles. You've seen me when the battles come, whatever it was. And, uh, and, and, and we've been knowing each other for all seasons. And uh, the word doesn't change. But we have to come to that place where uh, we dig in deeper. God told the nation of Israel, he said, I bore you on eagle's wings. You know, the, uh, I, I love the, uh, the analogies that God's word gives about uh, the eagle in comparison to the believer. And uh, when that eagle starts to try to teach the eaglet how to fly, it's sink or swim. And uh, what I've studied and understand about it is that the, eagles, the eaglet's got it made. He just sits in that nest. Mama comes and feeds him. And he didn't have to do anything but just soak up the sun and enjoy it. Until one day Mama pushes him uh, to the edge of the nest. And she gets him to the edge of the nest and swats him over. And then she swoops down and catches him and, and soars with him and takes him back up there. And after a few lessons... She lets him on, on his own because he's got to fly. And God said, I bore you on eagle's wings. And there are times when we walk with God, 
where God will bring us in victories in spite of whether our faith is there or not. I, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I, I, I imagine it's the same with you as it is with me, that I can go back to times in my life where there was nobody more surprised on my healing than I was. And you may well have received some of those yourself where you said, yes, I believe God. And you meant it in a mental ascent. You did believe that God could do that. But when you actually manifested the healing, I, I've had people in prayer lines. I enjoy prayer lines. I enjoy watching people get healed. And I've had people in prayer lines, I come to them and uh, I say, what's going on? Oh, I have fibromyalgia, Pastor. I heard everywhere. Well, let's get rid of that. I pray. I command it to go. Now, uh, see if you can find some pain somewhere. And sometimes they argue with me a bit. And sometimes they just start to do that. And, and they, then you see this look come over their face like they can't believe it. The pain is gone. And they can't even make it hurt. And they say, it's gone, it's gone. And then they catch themselves and say, but I expected that. And I've had times where I've said, you did not. <laughs> I mean, you, all you have to do is look at them and you know they weren't expecting that. What's happening is burying them on eagle's wings. But there comes a time for that eaglet that they have to fly on their own. And that doesn't mean you can't come and have the pastor pray for you or the evangelist pray for you or whomever. That doesn't mean that. But it means that there comes the time where you're going to have to start walking and living by what you've been taught, by what you've learned, and by what you say you believe. And whether you want to do that or not, it doesn't matter because Mama Eagle is going to push you out of the nest and there will be a period of time that, uh, that she'll carry you on eagle's wings. But eventually, you've got to learn to fly on your own. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That was just added. That was just extra. Did you find Hebrews chapter 10? At verse number 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Don't give up on your faith, because it has great promise of great things. That's, uh, you know, you get in that battle where the battle gets tough. And, and uh, in, in the midst of that battle, you just feel like, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep believing God. I can't do that. Amen. Hallelujah. Apple watches are wonderful. I have preached for an hour and a half, stood through a uh, half hour, 45 minutes of worship and praise, and had my watch tell me it was time to stand. I just, I, I don't understand that. Verse, verse number 36 says, For you have need of patience. And that word patience there uh, in the Greek hupomene is not a word that means that you just relax and wait for it to come. It's, ta it's a word that means perseverance. That you don't quit, you keep pressing in. We have need of, of perseverance that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You don't do the will of God because it's impossible to please Him if you don't keep walking by faith. You've got to keep faith working and you've got to understand how faith works and what faith is. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Who, who's that talking about? Every born again believer. That's you, that's me. The way we're going to live is by faith. So we've got to learn to develop in that faith and to grow in faith. And we've got to learn what to do when it seems as though our faith is weak. Amen. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in them. Isn't that interesting? God's got a soul. God made us in his own image. Where we are made trichotomy just like God is triune. And God has a soul. The soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. God has joy in watching a believer who will not give up and who will not quit. Watching a believer who will walk and live by faith. So he said, when, when you draw back, you give up, you quit. And, and, and we've seen that. My, my goodness, we've seen that. We see that over and over where whole churches are born. Preaching faith, teaching faith, until somebody doesn't get what they were believing God for. 
And as soon as somebody doesn't get what they were believing God for, they throw faith out the window and they give it up and deny it. And he said, I don't take any pleasure in that. I see bumper stickers, not since COVID, but I see bumper stickers where parents drive around with a bumper sticker that says that their, their child was uh, academic king or queen in their school. Uh, have you seen those? However they are. But I have never seen anybody drive around with one that says, my child is a complete failure in school. <laughs> because you take no joy in that. Am I right about it? You don't say, yay, he flunked again. <laughs> Nobody has flunked this many times. Amen. And still lives to tell about it. And, and God, uh, God can't take pleasure when we, when we give up. A and what happens? We, um, someone asked uh, Brother Hagen. Uh, it might have been old Roberts. It might have been Jesus. I don't know. Some, they asked somebody. <laughs> I, I think it was Brother Hagen. They said, well, Brother Hagen, if you pray for somebody and, and they're dying and, and they're not healed and they end up dying, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to say, next. <laughs> in other words, you don't quit. We don't give up. We keep pressing in. I'd like to win every faith battle I fight, but I look back in my life and I haven't won every one of them. But when I don't win, I get in and I dig in deeper so that I can go through and be stronger in my next level of faith that the devil can't beat me at these things anymore. Amen. So he said, don't draw back because my soul has no pleasure in those that draw back. But we are not. This is talking about us. This is talking about Grace Fellowship. This is talking about us. We're not of those who draw back under perdition or under loss, but of them that, that, that believe to the saving of the soul. I, I was thinking about this when I mentioned that I've been with you in all seasons. I, I have spent years of my life, uh, someone uh, described it like eating carpet fuzz, where I, it's just a matter of getting down before God. And, and seeking God for healing anointing. I hate sickness. I hate pain. I hate premature death. I hate those things. And uh, I, I, remember, I remember times while I was here in the Pekin area, Peoria area, that I would, I would just spend uh, days on end. I remember one period of time where uh, I, I fasted water only three days every week. I did that for uh, weeks on end until I started feeling a, a weakness that I couldn't keep up the pace. And then I went back just pressing into God. And uh, I, I, I'm at that stage again where I'm pressing in more than I've ever pressed in to know and to receive more anointing in my life and more understanding in my heart on faith and on healing. I've started back pressing it at, at a new level. It seems like someone would say, well, you know, you, you, it's going to take you uh, 12 chapters to talk about what we might be missing. It just seems like there's so many rules to faith. And the answer to that is no. It's, it's only a definition of what faith does. Somebody who just has faith. The woman with the issue of blood had no one to teach her faith. She just believed God. I heard Bill Winston say this. And I, I, it caught me. Uh, I, I wrote it down so I didn't forget it. He said, we are highly trained in unbelief. And that's the truth. We become skilled in unbelief. Uh, Americans, with our education and our teaching and our training, where you don't believe it unless you see it. And, uh, you, you know, if you can't see it, you don't believe it. You've got to have proof of everything. And, uh, you know, take your choice which way you go, whatever. But we become highly trained in unbelief. Faith is simple if you have simply have faith. But if you have faith, you're going to recognize that a person has faith because they're going to do what faith does. Amen. That was too simple, and I think I went right over your head with that. So let me say, if you have faith, and you have strong faith, 
you will do what faith does. Yeah. Amen. It must just be a bad statement or something. I don't know. Are you, did you catch what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Faith does what faith does. Yeah. If you really believe, you don't question God. If you really believe, you won't talk opposite of what God said to talk. If you really believe, then the negativity is not going to change you. I, I was talking to uh, P Pastor Bob and, and Debbie yesterday about a book I've been reading. It's great for a daily vo devotion book. It's by Jonathan Kahn. It's called uh, the, the Mysteries. And uh, each day is a new revelation. And he has some. He, he really has some good revelation. And the one that I had, had read two days ago just really stuck out with me. Uh, he said, he's, he's, he talks like he's got a, a disciple that he's training, the sage does. And he, and he says to him, uh, he said, we're, we're on a journey, we're walking along. And he said, I looked at, the, at, at, at him and I said, uh, what would you say about this road? He said, it's extremely rocky. And then they walked a little bit further and he said, what would you call this road now? He said, it's very sandy, a sandy road. They went on a little bit further and he said, what would you say about this road now? And he, all along the way, uh, the different things that they came to were, uh, he, he would, that's what he would call the road. And then he brought out the fact, he said, uh, when in, in the Bible and in Jerusalem, they name a road, not by the condition of the road, but by the destination. The Jericho Road, the road to Emmaus, and so on. They name it according. So it doesn't have anything to do with what's happening on the journey. What it has to do with is where you're going. And that's exactly what it is with faith. It's the matter of where we're going. And uh, sometimes it's rocky, sometimes it's hard, but faith doesn't take its eyes off of what God said and what God promised. Amen. Uh, I want us to look at another passage that the Lord has quickened to my heart lately. And this is really important to have an understanding of. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. You maybe already have this understanding of the verse. But if you do act like it's brand new to you, it makes me feel good. <laughs> Amen. Just kidding. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Holding, and that, that Greek word means to own or to possess, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, let's go back to verse 18. This charge I committed to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee, that thou uh, by them mightest war a good warfare. Now, let's, let's just put this in all practicalities. Um... We, we have people that are in the body or uh, people that we know and God gives us a word for them. And the word is a positive word. A word that they're going to come through this in victory. That God has them. That God's on their side to bring them through. It might be as simple and as clear as you are healed. God said it. And then... When victory doesn't manifest, you go back to the drawing board and say, I knew I heard God. I thought, sure I did, but apparently I didn't. No, you did. That prophecy, that word, God wants you to win every battle. Yes. And so he'll bring you prophecies. He'll bring you dreams. He'll bring you words that are to help you to fight the fight of faith. Because he wants you to win. And those, those words that you receive can be the key to get you over and to get you through into that place of victory. Now, uh, let's, let's see how Abraham's faith worked. Uh, because, and even more so, how God's faith worked. You understand, that, you understand that God had great faith. God has great faith. We often say that in the creation, God stepped out where there was nothing. 
and he called the whole world and everything in it into being. Well, that's not true. There was nothing in this realm. But faith is a substance of what we can't see. And faith is a literal, actual substance of whatever it is that you're believing God for. And when God called the world into place, there was a substance in the spirit realm that came into this natural realm that we live in. The spirit realm is more real than the natural realm. Because everything that we can see, touch, and feel came out of what to us is an unseen realm. When the prophet comes out and he sees all the armies of the enemy coming against him, there is another force in the unseen realm that the servant cannot see, but the prophet sees. It's a substance that faith touches and brings into manifestation by operating in faith because faith is a substance and so the prophet said Lord open his eyes and he looked and he saw the angels of God all around him all around him and then he was at peace because he saw what couldn't be seen I'm telling you the Bible tells us that angels have charge over us I love the I, 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 I told you last night I think I'm wearing out the 91st Psalm but you can't wear it out can you and I love it when it gets in there. I got to do the dramatics in my own uh, prayer time. A thousand will fall at my side. Ten thousand at my right hand. But it will not come nigh me. Only with my eyes will I see and behold the reward of the wicked. Because I've made the Lord even the most high my habitation. That's my dwelling place. The Lord. There shall no evil befall me. And neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. It ain't. Excuse my English, but it ain't talking about your house. It's talking about the Lord, your dwelling place. No evil can, but it's in an unseen realm. And he said, why is that? No plague comes nigh your dwelling? There are many Christians that can't believe for that. They walk around in such fear over COVID, over that virus. And I'm not, I'm not telling you that we shouldn't be careful. Be careful. That's okay. But we've all heard the story of John G. Lake in that plague. And, and he had him put the foam of a dead person in his hand. And they looked under the microscope. It was alive. And they put it in his hand. It was dead. And that's what I believe. I believe it can't come nigh our dwelling. Because he gives his angels charge over us. Faith, uh, faith has a substance in your life of angelic beings that are there to take care of you and to prevent the virus coming to you or anything else. Say, well then what happens? I'll tell you exactly what happens. The angels can only work when the word is manifested. They operate by the, by the hearing of the word of God. And when we talk doubt and fear and unbelief, the substance of faith can't work in that. Hallelujah. I'm going to give an altar call and I'm going to respond to it. I just, <laughs> amen, I just feel like God's wanting us to get a hold of this. Let's, uh, let's go to Romans chapter 4 verse 17. You know, uh, Abraham got God's promise when he was 75 and didn't get the son until he was 100. I, I used to preach years ago. I used to preach that God had him walk by faith for 25 years before he got the victory. And that he walked by faith. It says in here, we'll read it. it he, didn't, he didn't waver. He didn't stagger not for 25 years. That isn't true. He staggered a bunch. And it wasn't until he got to that place where he quit staggering when he understood his blood covenant with God. And that's Genesis chapter 17. And when he got to that place, and that's exactly the scriptures that are referred to here in Romans chapter 4 verse 17 on. It refers right back to Genesis chapter 17 when he got to that level of faith where he wasn't staggering. Romans 4 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Who said that? God said that. 
Well, how could, he, how could God say that he's made him a father of many nations where he hadn't even had a kid yet? He hasn't had a son. And now in this passage, because it's talking about Genesis chapter 17, Abraham's own body was now dead. And that means in the reproductive time. He couldn't, he couldn't have kids anymore. And Sarah never could. But he came to that place where in spite of it, he understood a blood covenant with God. Hallelujah. Ah, glory to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go home and just enjoy myself <laughs> in the Lord. I just. Do you understand, beloved? You have a blood covenant. Yes. Yes. And the blood covenant, when we, take, when we take the bread and the cup, that has become more precious to me than it's ever been. I preached a series on the blood, pleading the blood. And uh, it, it's become so real to me. I love taking communion now. Every day almost I, I take communion. Very rarely do I miss it. Because it's just become so real. I take that bread. And it wasn't just the fact that his body was broken. Do you understand that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he sprinkled blood seven times on the Ark of the Covenant? And do you understand that when Jesus died, he shed blood in seven ways in seven places the completeness of the sacrifice he bled from the crown of thorns he bled he bled from the beating in his face he bled from the beard uh, beard plucked out he bled from the stripes laid on his body he bled from the spear in his side he bled in the prayer in the garden he bled seven different areas that blood flowed through him and every time, look, beloved, I still hear and, and see preachers make mistakes on this. Jesus was not beaten 39 stripes. He was beaten with rods by the Romans who had no limit to what they would beat a person. No limit. And was he beaten with a whip? We always believe that he was, but he was beaten by Romans with rods. Paul was beaten with rods four times by the Romans and three times with whips by the Jews, 39 stripes save one. Every time that there was an opening, blood flowed, blood covenant. God was giving to us the most powerful covenant ever. You say, well, what, don't we most of us believe that there was a creation before the creation of Adam and Eve? Yeah. Well, what if they had a stronger covenant? They couldn't have a stronger covenant than the blood of the Son of God. Our covenant is in Jesus' blood. And every stripe was an opening that blood flowed. Where the broken body of Jesus was a matter of a blood covenant for you and for me to receive our healing. Yes. And there is, no, there is no right for us to stagger in unbelief. But we have a tendency to say, the road is rocky right now. The road is steep right now. The road is sandy right now. Don't look at the condition of the road. Look at your destination. And understand that faith has a substance behind it. Of total victory for whatever area you're walking through in your life. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Who wound him up? I, I just, amen. Put another quarter in and who knows what will happen. <laughs> All right, let me, let me try that verse again. Uh, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before him who believed, even God. In other words, we're talking here about God's faith. Who quickens the dead. I love that. I have people that, that they'll say, uh, I, I, I need prayer because the doctor said that part of my body is dead and it'll never come back to life. Well, that that's, I, it doesn't bother me because this says that God makes dead things come alive. Amen. And he calls those things that be not as though they were. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who against hope, when there was no hope, he believed in hope because there's hope in another realm. And that word hope is not the word for a wish. It's the word for an earnest expectation in joy. Hallelujah. So against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. 
And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Didn't even consider that. Didn't look at the road. Looked at the destination. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And here's an interesting thing when you talk about this with Abraham. Abraham got to a place where he staggered not through unbelief. And he believed God, and a year later, the son was born. But he didn't stop believing God. Because at 17 years later, God said, Take your son, your only son, to the mountain and offer him up to me on the altar. His faith is still working. He says to the man at the bottom of the hill, uh, bottom of the mountain, you stay here and the lad and I will return. He's still not staggering in unbelief. He's still believing. If, if I'm going to put him to death, God's going to raise him up because the promise is in him. You don't look at the road. Amen. So he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Unbelief will make you stagger. And we are highly skilled, highly trained in unbelief. That's why uh, the, the woman with the issue of blood, she didn't have one Kenneth Hagin book. She didn't have one Kenneth Hagin tape or uh, Kenneth Copeland teaching or Jerry Savelle. He, she, didn't have any, she didn't have any of my tapes or anybody else's. Well, what, then where did, how, how, come, how come she got such a great victory? Because she just did what faith does. She simply just believed and she said what she believed and she acted on what she believed and when she reached out to touch him, she reached out and received. She did what faith does. And that's what we've got to come to. We've got to come. The Bible says we have to come in the kingdom as little children. It is an amazing what you can teach a little child. All right, honey. Now listen. Uh, uh, you got to be a good little girl or Santa Claus won't come to your house. And then on Christmas, uh, Santa Claus is coming tonight. And so uh, let's put out some cookies and milk. So they get out cookies and milk. And they actually expect a fat man in a red suit to come down a chimney. And they don't even have a chimney. <laughs> they have an HVAC unit that doesn't have a chimney. But they actually believe that guy's going to come. Because that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus said become as a little child, some people say that means you have to become innocent like a little child. Little children are not innocent. <laughs> There's nothing innocent about a little child. We were watching a family feud the other day and, and how old is a child when they learn to when they learn to share? I said, never. <laughs> They were answering like two years old. Yeah, yeah. Put them together with another child and give them a toy they both want and see who wants to share. But they'll believe whatever you tell them. The, uh, I, I said this wrong uh, recently, so I don't want to say it again. The guy who comes and, and gets the tooth under, from under your pillow, the tooth fairy. And the, the, you know, they, they'll hang on to that tooth because if they don't get it under their pillow, when the tooth fairy comes, I said Sandman the other time and that wasn't right, but, but they believe that. And the Easter Bunny, a big rabbit comes to your house and leaves a basket, but they'll believe it. Yeah, they'll believe it. And that's the way we have to become. If God said it, that's it. That's what it's going to be. It can't be any other way. Can't be. <coughs> there was a, 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 a number of years ago, I don't know how many, but it's been a few years back, there was a, a, a little black lady pastor in Lexington, and she asked me to come and, and preach for them a, in their church. And she's, she's a powerful little gal. I, I don't know how old she was, but she was up there in years. And, and uh, so I, I preached, and I preached on faith. And when I, when I got done, I turned the service over to her. And she came up and she said, I know that's right. She said, my kids kept pressuring me that I had to go to a doctor and get a physical exam. And I didn't want to do it. But finally, to shut them up, I went to the doctor. And the nurse came in and she took my blood pressure. And she said, honey, you got high blood pressure. She said, I do not have high blood. 
She said, well, I just took it in, and it registered you got high blood pressure. She said, I'm telling you, I don't have high blood. A few minutes later, the doctor came in. He said, well, I can see here, Miss Anderson, that you got uh, high blood pressure. She said, I told that nurse, and I'm telling you, I don't have high blood. Well, he said, I'll have her take it again. So she came in, she took it again, and he said, your blood pressure is normal. I told you I didn't have high blood. I mean, there wasn't any way she was going to be convinced. That simple faith, where you just believe what God says, and you walk and live by what God says. Amen. Amen. And that's where we have to live. That's where we have to come to and where we live. So he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. When did he give glory to God? Before it was ever manifested. Let me tell you something else about this guy whose body was dead for reproduction. After Sarah died, he got remarried and had another five kids. So he kept his faith a working. <laughs> Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. And being fully persuaded that. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. How many kids you got? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, first number. <laughs> first 21. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him or counted to his account for righteousness now there are valuable truths all through here about faith first of all faith has hope even when there isn't hope when the doctors say there's no hope that's their report but that's not God's report and we go by God's report Faith is, is, is being fully persuaded that God is able. When, if you try to figure out well, how God's going to do that, you're wasting your time because you can't figure out how God's going to do it. He just does it. One of the simplest healings uh, that I ever saw, I probably have told you about this one before, was, was a person healed a carpet tunnel. And uh, I was in Madison, Indiana, and I was in the prayer line, and this woman come up, and she explained that she had this carpet tunnel, and she lived with pain and all this. It always hurts. And, and I said, well, let's get rid of it. And I took a hold of her hands, and I commanded it to leave, and she, she, there, there was no carpet tunnel. It was totally, totally gone. <coughs> and uh, she went back and sat down, and she sat behind my wife, and my wife said that she could hear back there talking to her friends saying, that, it's gone. That's spooky. Where'd it go? You know, like, you can't figure out where it goes. That's not the point. The point is God is able. Yes. No matter what it is, no matter what the circumstances, God is able. Amen. And, and it lets us know that faith doesn't stagger. James tells us that's wavering. A wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. And what does he say? Don't let that man or that person think they'll receive anything of the Lord. Faith has to come to the place where it doesn't waver. Amen. And faith gives glory to God even before the manifestation of the victory. Faith considers not the circumstances. Doesn't pay attention to the road. Because it's the journey of where they're going that they look at. It's impossible. Amen. For it not to work. And faith stays strong in faith. Now, I want to talk about some keys to getting faith to work in our lives. How many times have you heard me say uh, that uh, faith will work when you work the Word? The Word will work when you work the Word. And that's, that's as simple as it gets. You work the Word and it'll work. But you've got to work the Word. Do what the Word says. And see, we're at a disadvantage because... because in America especially and even in America churches we're taught contrary to the word it, we're taught unbelief and and some churches are really really taught unbelief one of my grandsons is uh, now engaged and uh, uh, the girl loves our church and so that's good but uh, she lives in eastern Kentucky and uh, 
he goes and uh, every, every now and then on a weekend, he'll go spend time with her family. And uh, she's in college in our area, so she's usually around there. But uh, he, he went to church with her. And they had one of those pastors that just preached that God will do it to you. I mean, God, you never know what God's going to do, but God will put you through stuff. And, God, and, and Jared said, I couldn't handle it. I, I just, I, I, he said, I had to just turn my ears off and just quit listening because I couldn't handle it. Well, we may not be extreme, but what you see is what you get. And I can believe it when I see it. And, and we live like that in America. And, and we live to believe doctors and nurses who are practicing. I, I mean, that should give us a clue. I, I've been practicing medicine for 30 years. Well, when did they quit practicing and get it right? I don't know. Anyway, James, James chapter 1 and verse 22. I, Ken Gobb, some of you know Ken Gobb. He called me a few days ago, and uh, he's back to traveling. That guy travels all over. He's number two in United in the most miles ever and for an individual. And uh, he said, I was at the airport, and they said, uh, have you tested positive? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I'm always positive. <laughs> and, and they said, no, you know what I mean. Uh, have you been around anybody that was positive? Oh, I only be around people positive. I, I'm not going to be around any negative people. <laughs> so, did anybody put anything in your suitcase that you don't know about? Well, how would I know if they did? <laughs> I mean, it's just... <clears throat> James 1.22 But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If you're a doer of the word, that's one thing. But when you hear it and don't do it, you're deceiving yourself. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. That's the word of God. And in the Greek, the Greek word there indicates somebody that bends over and just looks uh, peering in as deep as they can into the circumstance. And that's what we're to do with the Word of God. We're to stand so strong in the Word of God. And I preach this, uh, most of you, if not all of you already know it, but uh, that matter with Abraham, God spent 25 years teaching him faith. He taught him to look at stars and not to look at Sarah. Sarah was, she's old. I mean, she's in her 80s and then in, uh, at 90 before she gets pregnant. Phew, you talk about a miracle. And a miracle that few women want. <laughs> I mean, few women want to be pregnant when they're 90. Amen. You talk about Guinness, they would... But anyway, um, it, it, was, it, was, it, it took a miracle of God, but they got the miracle. And for 29, 25 years, God taught him, look at stars and daytime, look at sand. And imagine every one, every star, star every uh, grain of sand was a child born in his seed. And then he taught him to confess it, to call himself a father of many nations, to call Sarah the mother of many, a hostess of many. And uh, he taught him, and then he cut covenant with him. And God intended that covenant. I love that scripture in Hebrews uh, chapter 6 toward the end of the chapter when he said, And God more willing to make known unto us the unchangeableness of, of his covenant. And in other words, uh, as much as he wanted Abraham to get it, even more he wants us to get it. This end time revival, we've got to have people that believe God to the place where they live and walk in the impossible seeing the impossible done. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he not being a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and I don't like that word religious because it's come to mean something different, but in other words, if they seem to be spiritual, but he doesn't control his tongue, he deceives his own heart, 
and his spirituality is in vain. And what does it mean in vain? As far as seeing any victories won. You can't control your tongue. You're not going to see the victories won. So that man in verse 25 looks deep into the word of God. There was a couple that had the pastor come for dinner. And uh, you know, the, uh, she just hosted him and, and treated him royally. And, and when he left, she said to her husband, you know, I used my good tableware and I think the pastor stole my spoon. I, I just can't believe it, but I, I think he stole my spoon. And so she didn't say anything, but, uh, you know, close to a year went by, and they invited the pastor back for dinner. And when he came, uh, as they were eating, she looked at him, just not sure she even wanted to ask, but she said, Pastor, the last time you were here, uh, I gave you a spoon for your coffee. Did you keep that spoon and take it home? He said, no, I wiped it off and put it in your Bible. A year later, she still hadn't found the spoon. You got the story, right? Amen. So, it, it, looking into the Word is how we build faith. Seeing what the Word says. Confessing the Word. Standing on that Word. The Word builds faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, we have a spiritual law. It's not a target. It, it, it's something that we that we aim toward it's a law it's not something that's a target or that we aim. it's a law of God that we live and walk by the word it's called the perfect law of liberty why because it sets us free it sets us free from anything that would destroy that would beat us down or that would destroy us the, amen um, the man who doesn't control his tongue during that's one of the biggest parts of walking by faith is what you say and how consistent you are in what you say so it's important for us if we're going to walk in victory to keep that shield of faith about us above all taking the shield of faith Ephesians 6:16, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and when we've studied that uh, we, we know that 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 shield is is major uh, again 91st Psalm the Lord is our shield and our buckler the, the shield is that big Roman shield that's like the size of a door. The buckler is that smaller shield that they have in hand-to-hand -hand -hand combat. And the Lord is both of those to us, protecting us from the fiery darts of the wicked. And uh, we're, to, we're to stand strong with that shield of faith that whatever the devil shoots at us, our faith uh, takes care of it, covers it. Amen. I, I, I'm trying to bring it to a rapid end here I've I've gone strong and I, I I don't want to keep you too long another hour hour and a half maybe but no nothing beyond that just just kidding you got to always remember the power in your words God made us like him and by making us like him he gave us power in our words so that what you say is so important. People that talk about how old they are. Amen. I don't call them old codgers anymore. But people who talk about how old they are. And these things happen when you get old. Listen, listen folks. I haven't read one verse in the Bible that supports that. I love the Amplified translation of Psalms 103. I don't remember which, uh, which uh, verse it is. But that God forgives every one of all of our iniquities. And heals each one of all of our diseases. In other words, it, 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 you, it, the Bible doesn't say, now once you get to be a senior citizen, then you can't, you got to expect that all the things are going to start falling apart and you're going to have this sickness and that sickness and it's just going to happen. Devil wants you to buy that, but it isn't word. The Bible promised, I, that, was a, that was a weak amen. And I didn't even get any uh, bobbleheads, I don't think, on that, you know. At least give me some bobbleheads once in a while. The, the Bible says that with long life and shalom will he satisfy you. Nothing missing, nothing broken. 
And we're not to get, let the world press us into its mold where we think that because we're now in our 50s or our 60s or our 70s or our 80s or our 90s or we've gone over the 100 mark that we have to have sickness, that we have to have pain. Well, your body's wearing out. No, it's not. He renews our youth like the eagles. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ah. <sighs> Some suggest that, you know, you, well, you can't call things that you can't see. Well, people do that all the time. When we turn, change the thermostat, we call for a different temperature. Can't see that temperature. When uh, my grandfather raised milk cows, and uh, when it came time to milk, he'd go out to the barnyard, cup his hands, and call out, Kaboss! Kaboss! Those cows would recognize, even though he couldn't see the cows. He'd call them, and they'd come from unseen. Pretty soon you'd see the whole herd walking toward him. Pretty soon they'd be walking into the barn and going into their stanion to be milked. He called what he couldn't see. Amen. And you call those things that be not as though they were. And don't wait until you need a miracle to do it. Hallelujah. Remember, your words are seed. If you can only say what is, then you're only sowing what is. The farmer goes to a field of weeds, and if that promise is true, and all he sows is more weeds, all he's going to get is more weeds. Amen. I, I developed this little song. And I, before I start praying for people, I'm going to have David lead us in it. And uh, it's just, it's a scripture song, and it's a, some people would call it a little ditty, but my youth is renewed like the eagles. Can you lead us in that, David? You remember it? Let's do it. <laughs> Stand together.